sometimes we allow discouragement to set in and, and we don't see ourselves as God sees us. And, you know, I got to thinking about that verse, we are kings and priests. He's made us kings and priests. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about a king. I started to think about royalty and about kingship and how does a king behave? How do they talk? And I thought, what? You know, we are, Jesus is the king of kings. But we are a king no, nonetheless. Mm. And I started to think, what's behind this? And I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians. I'll just I'll just I'll just give one one verse. Minister on one verse if I can. Ephesians chapter three and verse ten. I'm gonna read it out of the New King James, but it'll be similar to your version. I got to thinking, you know, we've got responsibilities as the church of Jesus Christ, as kings and priests. We've got a responsibility to act and behave like a king. And a king knows where his resources are and what his resources are and how to draw from those resources. He doesn't complain. And I think, you know, we're all at a point in our walk with the Lord where this message is very relevant because we are expected to behave like kings. And if you think about royalty, the role of a king, he has great authority or she has great authority over the dominion that they rule. And that's the authority that each one of us have been given. So I'm going to read this verse. I'm skipping a lot of what I was going to share with you. We need to know who we are and behave as Jesus and our Father sees us. How does he see us? He, he doesn't see us the way we see ourselves. Thank God for that. He sees us totally different. He sees us as a king. You're a king. You're a king. That's how he sees you. He doesn't see you as some worn out, beat up, whatever. He sees you as a king. Not just for the sake of being a testimony to other people and unbelievers. And this is why I brought, brought the scripture out. Because it really, the Holy Spirit really opened this up to me this week. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. The background of this verse is the Apostle Paul is addressing the church in Ephesus about a mystery that's been around since the beginning of time, since the beginning God created the angelic realm. That mystery is the church and Christ's relationship or his love to it. And remember, remember this, what the proverb says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter but it is the glory of kings to search it out. You are a king. This verse is a powerful verse that has caused so much controversy. So I love getting into verses like that. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1, the Apostle Paul said, he was a steward of the mysteries of God. I love that. You are a steward of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God. Ephesians 3.10. Let's read it. To the intent now that the manifold wisdom, or the many various forms of wisdom, that means, of God, might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a mouthful. That verse. What this verse is saying is, it is you and I who teach the angels the wisdom, the mystery of God concerning matters pertaining to the church. Now, if you thought your only job was to live a holy life here, 
and to act as a king here on earth, I've got something to tell you. You've got a great responsibility here to teach the angels, the principalities, the powers, the mysteries of God. That is your and my responsibility. That is a powerful verse. Huh? Have you ever read it before? I've read it hundreds of times and read straight through it. It's our responsibility. God has given us. What this verse is saying is you and I who will teach the angels the wisdom, the mystery of God concerning matters pertaining to the church. The way you and I live our lives here is God's plan to teach the angelic house. That is an amazing, amazing verse. Us, mere human beings, we have a responsibility that goes beyond this realm. Wow. Do you realize the job of the church is to make something known, not just to each other or to other human beings, but also to angelic beings? That puts shivers up my spine when I think about that. Because I can be out in the middle of the bush, like Stuart, with no one around me, and there's angelic beings around. What am I teaching them? What am I doing in those quiet places where you can't hear what I'm saying? There's nothing hidden from him. Mm. The job of the church is to make something known, and that something is the manifold wisdom of God's love expressed through Jesus Christ, his Son, for you and me. Hang in there. This gets interesting. The angels had no idea this was God's plan. Now, I don't know how long they've been around. I don't think you know. None of us know, because the Bible doesn't tell us. could be millions of years, for all we know. But they had no idea that God had this plan. God had kept this a mystery, a secret. It had been a secret. The way God has dealt with angels that had fallen was so different than the way he deals with you and me. When an angel sinned against him, he cast them out of heaven. When you and I sin, he doesn't cast us out. If we go to him and ask forgiveness. Wow. What a privilege. Sometimes we don't think about it. We're talking about these majestic <laughs> angelic beings. God has given such favor to the dirt man, the human being. Why? I don't know. Wow. I don't know. So the church has a great responsibility to all angels, both those who have fallen and those who serve God. We have a responsibility to the fallen angels and the heavenly angels, to the demons alike. We have a responsibility. When Christ died on the cross and he rose again, he reconciled man back to God. He reconciled Jew to Gentile and he reconciled the angelic host to mankind. I just felt today we need an awareness of the angelic beings in our life and what God has placed them in our life for a purpose the purpose of the church was to unite all of God's creation to worship him at once human beings angelic beings the trees the sky the birds everything at once Colossians 1 verse 20 says we learn that through the blood at the cross Christ has reconciled and gathered in one all things in other words, he's united his whole creation back together again from the fall. This was a mystery to the angels. And after the fall of Lucifer and a third of them that were thrown out of heaven, there was division amongst the angelic hosts. Just like there's division amongst human beings today. But God had a plan to unite his creation back to him. How do we teach the angels? How do you teach angels? These magnificent creatures, these are not mere human beings like you and me. 
I don't, I don't want to get into all about angels today, but their abilities are far beyond yours and mine. How do we teach them something? There is only one way that you and I can teach the angels anything, and that is through the worship we have for God. That's why when I'm in a service and I don't see people worshipping, my heart sinks. Because that's what we're teaching the angels. Mm. If we don't have a freedom to worship, that's what we're teaching them. Mm. Don't worship. What are we teaching the angels? Worship being defined by how we live out our lives. It's not just music. Worship is humbling my belief and adopting his belief. That's what worship is. Humbling my belief and adopting his. And you say, Martin, the angels are expert at worship. And yes, they are. They've been worshipping possibly millions of years. Yes, they have. And Revelation 4 says multitudes of angels surround the throne. Worshipping God day and night. Saying, holy, holy, mm. holy. Mm. They are experts at that type of worship. But worship is more than just prayer. Worship is more than just singing. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is every moment of every day. The way I do my work, my conversation with others. That is worship. The Bible says they cease not, day and night, from saying holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Yes. And I guess there comes times when they think they've said it enough and God just moves a little bit more from one side to the other and he shows them another side of his glory. Mm -hmm. And they start again. Holy, holy, holy. Mm -hmm. They've seen another side of God. Mm -hmm. It never stops. God only has to move a little bit. And his glory radiates out. And it astounds these prestigious beings, these angelic beings. And they start all over again, holy, holy, holy. Mm. Can you even imagine what it's like to be in the presence of God Almighty? I can't. I can't. Because the effect of being in his presence is seen by these angels. They cannot stop saying, holy, holy, holy. And the angels don't cry holy for no reason. They cry holy because they're overwhelmed with God's splendor, his magnificence. That's why they cry holy. Not because they've been programmed, that's what you sing to me 24 hours a day. No, they are overwhelmed with his magnificence. Mm -hmm. and the angels have been worshipping God for possibly millions of years. And you're telling me that we're going to teach them how to worship. Worship defined for a human being is surrendering ourselves to an unseen God. Through faith in his written word. Something that's been a mystery to the angels. Now, we all need angels and we all need that, all the help we can get from them, so I certainly don't want to offend any angel today. But angels are a being that's been created and programmed by God to do a job. God has given you and me choice. It's called faith. And without it, we can't please Him. There is a difference. God, speaking through the Apostle Paul, says something amazing in Ephesians 3 here, that he's going to use the church to teach the angels the manifold wisdom of God, or another aspect or another side of God's wisdom. And here is why. When angels were created, the very first thing that they see is God. The very first word they hear is 
is God, worshipping God. They are born into an atmosphere of glory. They are born into an atmosphere of holiness. There is no sin in that atmosphere. That's the atmosphere they're born into. When you and I are born, you're born into a world full of sin. That's the difference. They don't know sin because they're born into that atmosphere where there is no sin. Mm -hmm. And when the one that did sin, sin, God flipped them out like a bug out of heaven that quick. Sin didn't stay. They're not born into a world of hardship like you and me. Angels are not born into a world of lack. Angels are not born into a world of sickness and disease, pain in your bodies. Angels don't understand blindness. They don't understand arthritis or pain. They don't understand heart disease. They're not born into that. That was not why God created them. But God put us here on this earth, a world full of sin, and allowed us to contend with that and to fight against it. And that's the mystery that the angels have never experienced. They don't understand that. Our job is to teach them how we conquer that. Mm -hmm. How you conquer sin. How you conquer gossip. How you conquer strife and dissension. The first conscious thought an angel has is God. And so much of what you experience and are experiencing, the angels never have and never will experience. The Bible said Lucifer was perfect in all his ways. Perfect. We certainly are not born perfect. And we're not perfect. When you and I are born, we're born as sinners tarnished because of sin brought into this world because of Lucifer and our forefathers. And John 4.23 said, Jesus said at the well, remember with the woman at the well, he said, the hour is coming. True worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then he goes on, he said, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. The Father is seeking those who worship him that have never seen him. That's what he's seeking. Mm. He's seeking those to worship him that choose, even when life is not perfect, to worship him through that imperfection. He's seeking those to worship him even when you're sick, to worship him in your sickness. That's what he's seeking. In heaven, there is no sickness. The Father seeking those to worship Him with their money even when they don't have much. The Father is seeking those to worship Him even when we don't feel like worshipping Him. That's what the angels have not experienced. Mm. That's what makes you and the angels different. <laughs> we live in a fallen world. The angels live in an atmosphere of glory. Have you ever thought about it? It takes no faith to worship God when you're in his presence and can see him. It doesn't take any faith to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All you're doing then is you're overwhelmed with his magnificence. But it takes faith to worship a God when you don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. And you can't see him and never have seen him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember when I was very sick and... I got to a point that's all I could do is thank God. Thank God. And, and, and I would think in my mind for the little things I could thank him for because I, I couldn't thank him for the pain. I couldn't thank him for, but I could thank him for the air I breathed. I could thank him that I, I was still alive. I could, and, and I just thank him. I worship him mm -hmm. in that state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> God is saying I'm going to use the foolish of this world. That's you and I. I'm going to use 
the redeemed drug addict, the ex-convict, the broken and the weak. I'm going to use a lesser being to confound these magnificent beings, these angelic beings. I'm going to use the broken and the rejected to confound the angelic beings through the faith that they have in me. Lucifer hates us. <coughs> he hates us. Remember the story of Job. Do you remember Job? Consider Job just for a minute. I'm not going to speak much longer. The scholars tell us that Job is the oldest book in the Bible, which means Job had no Bible. Okay, let's strip away a few things of Job for a start. He had no Bible. He had no pastor. He had no church. He had no television to watch the latest minister. He had no internet to look at ministry. He had no written word of God. He had no Torah. But Job loved the Lord, the Bible says. And the Lord knew it. And he loved Job. And one day Lucifer happens to walk in to heaven's atmosphere. And I can just see God baiting Lucifer here. Because nothing's a problem for God. Where you been? Where you been, Lucifer? Mm -hmm. I've been roaming to and fro. Ah, oh, and what have you found? Have you considered my servant Job? Mm -hmm. This is the first story of God showing his manifold wisdom through a human being to the angelic house. Mm -hmm. The first story. Have you considered him? Of course, Job replies, well, you've put a hedge around him, so not much to consider. And God, knowing that he had created a being that would worship him even through hardship. If I had have been God, I think I would have thrown something back at Lucifer right then. I would have said to him, well... You didn't do too good yourself, did you? And you were in glory. You had no reason to fall away. <laughs> Lucifer said, no. You take away that hedge and he'll fall. And we know the story. And this is the great mystery. This is the great mystery that we teach the angels every moment of every day. The way we live our lives. <coughs> we have a serious mandate. One is to win the loss. The other is to teach the angelic house. And that one is going to go with us into eternity as well. Mm. Have you considered my servant, Job? In other words, God is saying to Lucifer, this is what worship looks like. You thought you knew how to worship. The Bible tells us he was the worshipper of all worshippers. There was none like him in the angelic host. He was Mr. Worship. And yet God has taken this earthly man, this foolish creation made out of dirt, and he's lined him up against the superior being. And he said, this guy can worship better. <laughs> Even when he's in trouble. Mm. <coughs> that's the love he has for you. Mm. That's the grace and the favor that's on your life. And here is the mystery Paul's talking about in Ephesians. That the church is to teach the angels. What an amazing commission. Anybody can worship God when things are going well. But it's when things are not going well that everyone in heaven is looking down and watching. Mm -hmm. They're all watching. When things are not going well in our life, they're all watching. And the cloud of witnesses are watching. And they're all waiting. What's she going to do? What's she going to do? Oh, no, 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 don't say that. Oh, she's changed her mind. Now she's worshipping God. <laughs> and the cloud of witnesses get behind it and start backing it. That's what's happening over your life. Has he considered my servant Job? God wanted Lucifer and all the angels to see and understand his manifold wisdom. The first time in the Bible, God reveals it to the angelic host. Hmm. Lucifer counterattacks. 
Will Joe, Will Val, Will Amy, Will Mike serve God for nothing? Will my sister serve God for nothing? You take away everything he's got and we'll see then if you'll serve me. And God's got enough faith in you and me that he says, I'll strip the hedge away from your life. Because I know that she'll come back and he'll come back and he'll worship me. Mm-hmm. Something the angels never understood. Mm-hmm. I can hear God saying, You couldn't serve me when you had everything. What a slap in the face mm-hmm. to the head worshiper. You couldn't serve me when you had everything. And you're in an atmosphere of glory. You couldn't serve me. But here is a human being. Amongst the trials and the tests and the pain and the hardship of life. Even if you strip everything away, they will still worship me. Mm-hmm. Now you can see why God loves you so much. And Satan is always the accuser of the brethren. And that was what he was trying to do. Accusing Job. Job won't do that. Job won't worship you. And God said, you watch it. You watch it. He'll worship me. I often think about this. How you could go from being the head cherub angel, the leader of the angelic. To throwing it all away Mm. for nothing. I don't understand that. Mm. Just so you can say, look at me. Look at me, look at who I am. You throw it all away. Mm. Take away the curse, the hedge, and you'll curse you to your face. And God removes the hedge. Job is pushed to the limits. And yet he still cries out this. Though he slay me. Yet, I will still trust him. Mm. It's a good verse for us today. It doesn't matter how bad it may get in life. Though he slay me, yet I will still trust him. And all of heaven at that moment saw the manifold wisdom of God in operation. Every time an angel sees us worship, in the middle of storms, they are reminded of the incredible manifold wisdom of God. That's why worship, that's why the way we live our lives is so important. Because we're teaching the angels. There's only one thing Satan is after and it's what's coming out of your mouth and my mouth. That's why he said, he'll curse you. He's after what's coming out of our mouths. And you might say in closing, I'd never curse God. But when we say, I cannot love my brother because he's got this problem or that problem, we're cursing God. When I say, I won't give my first fruits to the Lord, we're cursing God. What are we doing? We're saying we know better. I know better than you, God. That's what we're saying. That's cursing God. Many people don't realize the hedge has been removed. Christians, in their lives, God has allowed the hedge to be removed for a reason. Job worshipped God with everything he had. Because true worship is... True worship means... A surrender of everything, everything that we have. True worship requires our total self, not a partial, a total. Job submitted himself to a God that he cannot see. But the angels submit themselves to a God they can see. What a smack in the face for Lucifer and a third of the angels. What a lesson for the other two-thirds that were in heaven. Have you considered my servant, Mike? 
That's what's ringing out in heaven today. Have you considered my daughter, Anne? Because Lucifer is the accuser of their brethren. The Bible tells us that he stands before God accusing you and me day and night. And God's counter to that is this. Have you considered my daughter, my son? What is God saying to the angelic host today about you? What is he saying to the angels about me? Have you considered my daughter, Amy? Have you considered my son, Mike? They can teach you something about worship. Each one of us has been assigned, according to Matthew, an angel. Everywhere you go, there is an angel with you. Some have more than one, I believe. And I leave you with this thought. What are you teaching your angel? What are you teaching your angel? Is the words of your mouth edifying and teaching your angel the glory of God? Or are our words counter to his word? And we're teaching our angels the wrong thing. Heaven forbid that we would teach the angels how to sin. Heaven forbid that. I'll leave you with that thought. Father, thank you for your word. Such a beautiful subject. But such a powerfully deep subject. Lord, that each one of us need to come to terms with in our own life. Use this message, this brief message, to stir our hearts. To create a greater awareness in our lives of what we do and what we say is more than just myself, that I am teaching the angels. We glorify you, Father. We thank you that you loved us enough that you gave these majestic beings to stand with us, to minister to us. And Lord, today we found out our job is also to minister to them. Mm. Help us to do this and to do this well. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Mm.